Nearly 1 million Americans over the age of 5 are considered functionally deaf. On today's episode of Idaho State of Mind, we explore deaf culture in the U.S. We sat down with deaf people who choose to get a device that can help them hear again and to others who believe being deaf is who they are. We also explore a new phenomenon, record hearing loss in the young. We'll look at how modern technology is wreaking havoc on our youth's ears. But we'll also introduce you to one girl who experienced the power of a wish with a little help from ISU's pharmacy students. Idaho State of Mind starts right now. Thank you for joining us on Idaho State of Mind, where we endeavor to educate the citizens of Idaho on the state of higher education. I'm Libby Howe. This is a production of Idaho State University, and we are proud that the majority of the show's content is created by ISU Mass Communication students. The understanding of deaf culture is relatively low in the U.S. Census information for deaf people is considered to be poor. The last deaf-specific national census was conducted way back in 1974. The lack of information on this population may be surprising, but one place the deaf population is always thought of is at a university. Today, we are taking a look at options available to the deaf, including some ISU programs and staff involved in improving the lives of people with hearing loss. First, we start off with a look at advanced technology for the deaf. They're called cochlear implants and they are helping people who were once deaf to hear again. Idaho State of Mind Sean Forey joins us in the studio with more on these life-changing instruments. Sean? Thanks Libby. From toddlers to the elderly, cochlear implant patients can now live normal lives with the, these high-tech devices, but they still face many challenges when adjusting to our loud world. Take a look. Today is Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you hear my voice? <laughs> is it very soft? Sounds like your computer. Yep. Kristen Hughes is just one of nearly one million Americans who are deaf. Kristen lived her whole life being able to hear until one day her hearing just shut off without warning. Nine months later, thanks to cochlear implants, she can now hear again. A cochlear implant is a prosthetic device that we implant into a, into a person's cochlea where the hair cells are, which is how we hear. And the hair cells have died for some reason or did not form during birth. So we put an electrode array in there, which will then generate the electrical impulses that the hair cells would have produced had they been viable. During a two-hour surgery, doctors place part of the implant into the patient's skull, which then magnetically connects to a part outside the skull, and it looks like a hearing aid. This then picks up sound and turns it into a radio wave that is sent inside the skull and electrically pulsed into the person's brain to understand. In accordance with the FDA, any deaf person aged 12 months and up can receive an implant. I have an 86-year-old patient who, he said it just changed his life because now he can hear his grandchildren and he can talk on the phone to his children who live far, further away. You know, if you've ever read about Helen Keller who said, when asked would she be deaf or would she be blind, she said she would be blind because blindness separates you from things, but deafness separates you from people. Cochlear implants require a lot of work from the patient and their supportive family, especially when spending up to six months getting the brain used to the loud noises associated with life. However, while the implants are helpful, it still isn't a cure. Now, the number of people with cochlear implants rises 20% every year, sitting at approximately 220,000 patients worldwide, each person having their own unique success story. Libby? Thanks, Sean. Now, I understand that that was the first time Kristen had her implant turned on and hearing her voice for the first time since she went deaf. That must have been such an emotional thing to witness. Yeah, it was definitely a great experience to be a part of, but I'd say her husband was probably the most excited one in the room, probably because he won't have to carry around the notepads anymore. <laughs> Libby. Oh, thanks a lot, Sean. Now, one major hurdle for young people who are deaf or have severe hearing impairment is learning to communicate with others. Idaho State of Mind's Chris Gabitas reports on a program at ISU Meridian that is helping deaf children learn to speak. Is that nice of this wishy-washy to save the animals? Yeah. 
Five-year-old writer Amistoy was born with moderate severe hearing loss. Since he was a baby, he's worn hearing aids to help him distinguish sound frequencies. Jacks. Jacks. Ryder's little sister Kylie has a similar hearing loss. Both are enrolled in ISU Meridian's Toddler Early Listening and Language Program, TEL for short. Amy Hardy is clinic supervisor. Uh, the goal is to really enhance uh, language and literacy in, in young children. Tell meets twice a week for private and group therapy sessions. In this private session, Ryder works on articulation. Football. Football. In group therapy, he listens as Hardy reads a story that focuses on words that use specific sounds. The games, the exercises, help the children build social skills they'll use in a mainstream classroom. Ryder's mom, Andrea, says Tell is a hidden gem in the Treasure Valley the important part of her children's therapy. Two kids, I'm hoping that they're going to keep developing along their language path um, just like any other child would without a hearing loss and continue pr to progress with vocabulary, um, syntax, uh, learning more pragmatic language and just keep growing in that field so they're at the level of their peers or beyond. So. Emma Stoy has set the bar high for her kids and she's confident they'll reach it. As for Ryder, he loves to swim, snowboard, and he's already thinking about college. What does he want to be when he grows up? A teacher. And that's a career that makes mom proud. Chris Cabitas, Idaho State of Mind. If you'd like to know more about the TEL program, go to our website at isu.edu slash Idaho State of Mind. Scholarships are available to help families cover the cost of therapy. Can you imagine being a 17-year-old in high school with the average hearing of an 85-year-old? Well, that's just what happened with Jana Mitchell. She's now 23. She has lost all of her hearing. Even the strongest of hearing aids brings no sound. A cochlear implant could let her hear again, but she chooses not to. Idaho State of Mind's Summer Geoc finds out why some deaf people choose to live life without the implant. I was sitting in class, paying attention real well, of course, and it was weird because the teacher was lecturing and then when she would turn around to write on the board, she'd stop talking right in the middle of a sentence. Jana was born with slight hearing loss and by the time she graduated high school, her hearing was completely gone. The doctors can't explain what happened. They only know that she will most likely never hear again. One sound that Jana never heard until her first hearing aid was the simple sound of a pop can opening up. If I see somebody get a can, I watch for them to open it. I was so excited about that. I love that. It felt like a tickle. But later, when I lost that specific sound, that kind of sucked. When she was a little girl, she had dreams of becoming an EMT and then going on to become a registered nurse. Her senior year of high school, she was approved to go through the EMT program, but right before the test, she was declined due to her possibly becoming a safety hazard. I really didn't deal with it the first year. I just did what I needed to do. But of course, later down the road, <laughs> I would kind of lose it. And you think about, yeah, I will never hear that again. I will never hear this person again. I will never hear my music again. She is eligible for a cochlear implant, but she says it costs around $40,000. It is a major surgery, and you have to pay for the upkeep and go through a lot of speech therapy and relearn what the sounds are. Here is an example of what it would sound like. But her main reason for not getting the implant is to keep the memory of the sound of music alive. I grew up with music. I love music. I still love music. But because I still remember what it sounds like, at least some of it. I don't want to destroy that memory. Another ISU student majoring in welding who has a cochlear implant has doubts it was the right decision. He talks about... Yeah, give me a lot of credit. Mm, yeah. So it bothers me, so mm -hmm. it broke too. So I have no use for it. Yeah. Kind of regret it. 
Another main reason many deaf people choose not to get the implant is because of deaf pride. Not being able to hear is who they are, and they want to embrace it and live life to the fullest in their own way. Be careful about it. Think hard. Don't let other people pressure you. It's your disease, not the other. What you feel is right, go for it. If you don't feel right, don't do it. Just because Jan is not going to get the cochlear implant, she's not going to let it slow her down. She decided to go on to Idaho State University and major in web design. She also participates in ISU's drumline, pep band, and jazz band. If she could hear one sound again, it would be... Trumpet with a mute. You know, it's that quiet jazz. <laughs> At Jana's home, Summer Geoc, Idaho State of Mind. Mm, I know there are many sounds I would miss if I couldn't hear, and I certainly take hearing for granted. Stories like this really remind us to be grateful. Thank you very much, Summer. For those students on campus who do wish to receive help for their hearing impairments, ISU has disability services. While deaf services are just a small portion of their offerings, they make sure to accommodate students and their variety of needs. Some students really require skilled, wonderful interpreters with lots of experience, while others with a similar hearing loss uh, don't have that need, and they'll just take any interpreter that's available, which really benefits us who hire interpreters because we can't always get the best uh, interpreters. We have some of the best, but not all of them are the best. Disability Services works closely with sign language interpreters that go to classes with the students and give real-time interpretations. Depending on the students, some may simply request someone in their class to take notes in addition to their own. Deaf students are also given certain accommodations for taking tests. As with any general service they offer, Disability Services looks for certified and well-trained professionals. Many of us have seen a deaf interpreter at an event or seen two deaf people communicating, but did you know that sign language is not universal? Idaho State of Mind's Ellie Spencer demystifies this diverse language. Sign language isn't universally the same. Most countries have their own sign language, but here in the United States, we use American Sign Language, or ASL. ASL is a language that can't be written and is spoken with the hands. It is structured unlike the English language we speak. It is what is called topic comment, which means you say what you are talking about first and then what it is doing. It's like if the girl goes to the store, you would say, girl, she goes to the store. Learning sign language is important for everyone to do. Someone who is deaf doesn't have the opportunity to know another language. Sign language is their only way of communicating. Even just learning to fingerspell the alphabet could be helpful. Some deaf people have no patience, and if a person doesn't know sign language, they'll just walk away. But it helps if you know how to fingerspell, because then if you don't know the sign, then you can fingerspell words out. So it's really slow, and you've got to be patient to read it, but it helps you get your point across some way. Jane Alexander is the mother of Lisa Santos, and she's deaf. Lisa feels it has brought her family closer together because they have a mother who speaks with her hands. It's definitely enhanced my family a lot because a lot of us are starting to learn sign language and then we have that understanding um, for deaf people. But my two kids know sign. and that has improved our relationship a lot. With sign language as the third most popular language in the United States and with about 268 million people using it, taking a class or learning a few signs could be helpful to many people. At the Student Union Building at Idaho State University, Ellie Spencer, Idaho State of Mind. If you've always wanted to learn sign language, you may be interested to know that many colleges and universities across the nation allow students to take sign language to fulfill their foreign language requirements. With all the iPods and MP3 players young people are listening to constantly, it raises the question, is this affecting their hearing? And the short and disturbing answer is yes. Idaho State of Mind's Deanne Coffin joins us in the studio with more on this growing epidemic. Deanne? 
That's right, Libby. I found that there is a growing trend over the last decade with more and more young people experiencing hearing loss at a young age because of the latest headset technology. Researchers fear the growing popularity of portable music players and other items that attach directly to the ears, including cell phones, is contributing to hearing loss in young people. Everywhere you turn these days, you see the younger generation listening to their portable music players, and it is becoming more of a full-day listening experience, as opposed to just when jogging or working out in a gym. This is a trend that has been growing ever since the portable Walkman came out a few decades ago. I listen to music all the time. If I'm not with my friends and stuff, then I'm listening to music. Yeah, I listen to it blaring, like, extremely loud, so I can hear everything, the treble in the bass and all that. Noise-induced hearing loss happens any number of ways, from attending noisy concerts and clubs to using firearms or loud power tools, or even recreational vehicles such as motorcycles and snowmobiles. In most cases, you don't know early on. It takes multiple exposures and sometimes years to find out. A lot of times the side effect of that is ringing or roaring in the ears. Those are usually the first two signs of a, that you're causing damage but a lot of times it's just a later onset of damage. No, I haven't really noticed any difference. It may start to occur later on in life, but not right now. I can't tell the difference. My family says I'm hard of hearing, but no, I feel the exact same. I have noticed any difference. Often people turn up the volume to ear damaging levels. A survey published by Australia's National Acoustic Laboratories found that about 25% of people using portable stereos had daily noise exposures high enough to cause hearing damage. And further research by Britain's Royal National Institute for Deaf People determined that young people ages 18 to 24 were more likely than other adults to exceed safe listening limits. You can go into your settings and actually limit the amount of volume that you can set to the max volume to help protect your ears. With the new technology of iPods and MP3 players, there is also the latest technology in hearing aid devices that are made to look like the hearing device we use with cell phones. Well, and especially now, like the hearing aids that we are dispensing have Bluetooth capabilities built into them. So that's kind of like a feature that's already set. So it's like, you know, vets can come in in their 20s that need to be fit with hearing aids and I can link them to their cell phone, I can link it to their iPod and they think that that's a really great feature so then they're not so hesitant about it too. Experts recommend protecting hearing in ways such as standing away from loud speakers and using hearing protection when using loud machinery at work, home or recreation. Essentially what we want to do is keep the decibels around 85 decibels or below. Now granted, loud noises can cause damage, but the other factor to that too is how, what amount of time you're using at, at a loud volume. You know, if it's at 85 decibels for two seconds, you're probably okay. If it's at 85 decibels for 10 hours, you're probably gonna cause some damage. Researchers say that listening to a portable music player with headphones at 60% of its potential volume for one hour a day is relatively safe. Libby, I can remember the days when I would go to loud concerts and stand right up by the loudspeakers and I would leave the arena with my ears buzzing for days after. It really makes me think about how much hearing damage I caused for myself. And my dad used to be a contractor his whole life and he was around loud saws and loud machinery and he had hearing loss as he got older, which affected everything in his life. And now I know what he meant when he used to tell me to turn my music down or I would end up with hearing loss like him. Libby? Thanks, Deanne. It sounds like everyone should be more aware of the possibilities of hearing loss at really any age. The professionals say that 85 decibels or less should be a safe range on your music devices and remember to limit the amount of time that you listen to them. Epic journeys, fortunes of gold gained and lost, and plenty of detail about living in the Idaho wilderness during frontier times. Idaho State of Mind's Martin Gallegos digs further into one ISU professor's new book about Idaho's gold rush. Dr. Wayne Minshaw, professor of ecology, isn't the biggest fan of mining, but he is interested in Idaho history and self-reliant living. While doing studies on stream ecology in the Frank Church wilderness, Minshaw was given the diary of Lumen Caswell, a prospector from the late 1800s. Uh, and realized that he'd spent uh, 10 years at the end of the 1800s, first part of the 1900s, basically being self-sufficient. I wanted to know more about it. 
Minshaw's book follows the lives of Caswell, his two brothers, and two associates. It chronicles a 2,500-mile trip made from western Colorado into central Idaho in hopes of finding gold. And unlike a lot of other people, they were successful in achieving that goal. Through the diaries of Lumen Caswell, Minshaw provides insight into these prospectors' day-to-day -day lives, from repairing boots to caring for livestock. Minshaw hopes that readers can learn more about little-known Idaho history and the Frank Church wilderness. At the Gale Life Sciences Building, Martin Gallegos, Idaho State of Mind. Minshaw's book, Wilderness Brothers Prospecting, Horse packing and homesteading on the Western Front is currently available on Amazon.com. There are many opportunities on campus for students to help students. Peer mentoring, advising, and tutoring are great ways for students to interact with each other and to learn. Idaho State of Mind's Ellie Spencer has the story. Tutoring is described as a person who gives individuals or a small group instruction. But what about the tutor? Studies have shown not only the person being tutored, but also the tutor benefit from the process. The person being tutored is getting the help and guidance they need to be able to finish their homework. There's this process of even for somebody who's more or less able to do most of what they need to do, you hit glitches. And then instead of having the glitch become a giant thing that stops you when you can't go any further on your homework, um, you can go ahead and somebody can help you over that tiny little step and wow, you can do the rest of this. While the person being tutored is learning the concept, the tutor also benefits because they may be helping with an English paper about a concept they know nothing about, which makes it a learning process for both. One thing that, that I get a benefit from is when I'm helping the other students learn these concepts, it just kind of helps uh, solidify those with me. Not only is peer tutoring beneficial in an academic way, but as well as a social. Peers get to interact with each other on a regular basis and friendships are formed. Also meeting with a peer tutor takes some of the pressure off. I think it's a lot easier meeting with a student tutor because you're not as scared, you know, your nerves aren't there like what if I say something wrong? I mean you feel like you can um, express yourself better. Idaho State University offers more than just student tutoring programs. They offer peer advising and peer mentoring as well. Sometimes attending a new college can be stressful and scary, but having someone by your side to help lead you through it can calm those nerves. The Student Success Center offers peer advising, mentoring, and tutoring in all subjects on campus and is free to students. At the Rendezvous on Idaho State University's campus, Ellie Spencer, Idaho State of Mind. More information about peer advising, mentoring, and tutoring is available on the Idaho State of Mind website. Spaghetti has been around for hundreds of years, but for the past 19 years, this delicious dish has been helping children get their greatest wishes. Idaho State of Mind's Brigham Larson tells us how spaghetti and ISU's pharmacy students fulfilled the wish of one Idaho girl. This is Tinley Curtis. Tinley has a form of cancer called astrocytoma. Her case is unique because even though 99% of the tumor was removed in the initial operation, it continues to grow back at a slow pace. As any parent will tell you, it isn't easy to have sick children, but with an illness like cancer, it can be a rough ride. You know, when you find out your children are sick, you ride a constant roller coaster of up and down and up and down and up and down and where she is in a situation that she's in, watch and wait, it always feels like the roller coaster and sometimes it's nice to just stop and get off the roller coaster for a minute and just relax and, you know, regroup and then you can get back on the roller coaster and you're on your way. Organizations like Make-A-Wish Foundation make it possible for families to take a break from the roller coaster of illness in order to ride some real roller coasters or whatever it is the child wishes. For kids who have sicknesses or brain tumors, they make a wish and whatever they make a wish, that what hap that's what happens. So like, I made a wish to go to Disney World and I went. Funding for these wishes is made possible by groups like the Professional Pharmacy Student Alliance on the ISU campus. The PPSA holds an annual spaghetti feed on the ISU campus to help raise funds for the Make-A-Wish Foundation. They recently held the annual feed in order to raise funds for Savannah Barnes, a seven-year-old girl from Pocatello. 
Savannah was diagnosed with a congenital heart defect along with other conditions and has also made a wish to visit Disney World. The event is organized by a team of students from the pharmacy school, campus faculty, and the Make-A-Wish Foundation. They receive donations from people in the area and national sponsors such as Caterpillar, Global Mining, and the Rite Aid Corporation. I mean, these, these sweet children have to go through a lot, and we want to make sure that they get to have this uh, uh, joy in their lives with their family, and we want to make that happen. Parrish also said that the PPSA was able to raise enough money to fully fund Savannah's upcoming trip. Reporting from Pocatello, Brigham Larson, Idaho State of Mind. ISU College of Pharmacy students hold their spaghetti feed every year in either February or March. It's an election year, as I'm sure you're probably aware, as the, it's a little hard to miss all the headlines about the presidential race. But on another episode of Idaho State of Mind, we are talking politics. Don't worry, we're not going over the pros and cons of candidates. This episode will give you a little refresher on the world of politics and how it works. How exactly does the Electoral College work and why should you get out there and vote? We'll also give you an inside look into university student elections, how the politicians of tomorrow are shaped today. Don't miss this little refresher course before you hit the polls this fall. And that is all for this episode of Idaho State of Mind. Thank you for joining us. From the campus of Idaho State University, I'm Libby Howe. We'll see you next time.